I'm Diane Flax, and over the next hour, we're going to be looking at some deep, dark family secrets, including my own. As parents, we all have these moments when we realize we're unconsciously passing things that we do onto our children. The way that they shrug. My kids make a ugh sound whenever watching reality TV. That comes from me. My youngest son, when you ask him, do you remember that, Johnny? He'll say, vaguely. I think that comes from me. I only recently realized that I have a pretty negative quality that I am worried I may have passed on to my kids. Keeping secrets. I didn't realize that I was a secret keeper. It was a secret, even from me. And that's a problem. Hiding from your true feelings, your real thoughts, this can have long-lasting repercussions on relationships and on your sense of self. Denial and avoidance are not always great life strategies. And as I realized at this point in my midlife, the effect that it has on me, I realized I did not want to pass this on to my kids. And I wondered, are they all right? Do they keep secrets? I admit that even talking to them about the topic of secrets was uncomfortable for me. Over the next hour, to explore the reasons why we lie or hide ourselves within families, I'll talk to chaplain and author Carrie Egan, who offers a fascinating take on this question. We'll also talk to psychologist Robert T. Mueller, who specializes in the positive and negative effects of secrets in families. Finally, I'll ask my mother about why it seems so much easier for her to talk to her grandkids about her secrets than to me. I'm Diane Flax, and you're listening to Family Secrets on CBC Radio 1 and Sirius XM. so curious and frankly a little hurtful that it was easier for my mother to talk to my children than to me. For insights into intergenerational secret keeping, I reached out to professor clinical psychologist, trauma therapist, and author Robert T. Mueller. His latest book is called Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up. I found out that, like me, he had a mother who was a child during the Holocaust. But there was one big difference between his experience with his mother and mine. I I got kind of bombarded with a bit of the opposite in my family. Like, I got a lot of stories about the Holocaust. And that can be a bit tough in its own right, but it gave me such an appreciation for what my parents lived with. It gave me such an appreciation for their experience. So my mother was... A child uh, during the Holocaust. She was six years old. I'm, I'm Jewish. My mother uh, and father are also Jewish, and um, so my mother grew up in Hungary, uh, Budapest, Hungary. And uh, in 1944, she was a little kid, six or seven years old, and that was the most dangerous time for Jews in Hungary because uh, the the pace of uh, killing was extremely high, especially in that year, and so. What her parents did was they got her false papers, got her to live with um, a woman who was Christian, who was willing to take a big risk, obviously a huge risk, and um, was told, you cannot tell anybody you're Jewish, and your name is not, you know, what your name is. This is your name. It's really hard for a six-year-old to keep secrets under the best of circumstances, but her life depended on it. And in that case, actually, the secrecy was, um, was life-saving. So it, it, that's why I say when it's a, uh, it's a double-edged sword, it can be, come from a place of protectiveness, um, but it can also, you know, it can also go south and, be, and become very, uh, very disturbing and troubling to family members. You know, this question of how do families tell stories? And in families that keep secrets... Uh, there isn't a lot, there's an impoverishment of storytelling. Kids who end up feeling a disconnection very often from their from their parents and sort of like, I, I don't know you, who are you? And that sort of thing. But yes, families where there are no stories, um, the, the stories can be so enriching and can really kind of create a shared experience and a, and a sense of connection. 
there's an important distinction between family secrecy and family privacy. And that's something that people often do get um, confused, especially families that I've worked with in therapy. There's a sort of frustration with the teenager who's keeping secrets. But uh, privacy is actually something that's developmentally normal, necessary, you know, for healthy development in, in adolescence especially. So you want to see some respect for privacy in homes, and that's just an important thing. But when we talk about family secrecy, as I mentioned, it often comes from a place of a, a, a wish to protect, um, and and then that's, that goes off the rails pretty quickly. Um, so I'll give you an example. I worked a few years ago with a family where, many years earlier, the father of the family had committed suicide. So he had died, he had died by suicide. Almost everybody did not want to talk about it. It was as if dad was deleted from the family, as if he was never there at all. Mom very quickly uh, moved on to a new relationship. Most of the kids wouldn't talk about it. Now, the, the person who I saw in that family for therapy, the youngest son, who at that point was in his early 20s, felt just driven, you know, it, it drove him up the wall. I mean, it felt to him going home for family, uh, you know, for Thanksgiving or whatnot felt like walking on eggshells and this sort of feeling of this oppressive silence that cast a pall over the family. And, and uh, to him, it led him to feel that he had trouble trusting in relationships. He had trouble, you know, he, he often questioned people's intentions, you know, uh, you know that, that difficulty trusting. So it really had very negative effects. Now, the, the family was trying to protect the family's image. I mean, that's really what, you know, from, out, from the outside world, because to them, the suicide was seen as very shameful, as, as is often the case when there's mental illness. There often is a, a sense of shame in families because because of that, unfortunately. But um, despite that attempt to be protective of the family, um, it actually ended up breaking the family apart. So it was really very counterproductive in the end. And was there anything that that son could do to cope with, even if he couldn't repair it with his family, what could he do to deal with that legacy of secrets and shame for himself? Well, uh, a theme in, in our work together had to do with this idea of pretending, um, kind of uh, feeling like he didn't want to keep silence in his life, in his, in his relationship with his girlfriend. The kind of family he wanted was really different than the family he grew up with, and that was something that really, um, you know, carried him through. Where he had difficulty was when he nevertheless found himself behaving in secretive ways. And so, you know, old habits die hard. And he kind of took on many of those characteristics that part of himself, you know, it was sort of uh, an internal struggle. There was a part of him that that behaved in a way that was consistent with his family of origin, but there was another part of him that, that couldn't stand that. And, and, and we really had to work with kind of looking at um, what is it he identified with? How did he want to see change in his life where does protection and recreating end? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, it's hard to know. It has a lot to do with the tolerance for difficult feelings in some families. In some families, there's, a, there's kind of an openness to expressing loss. There's an openness to, to feelings that are kind of, you know, what you might call more negative feelings, you know. Um, such as betrayal and 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 trauma, you know, the the ones that go along with trauma. And I, loss is a big one. Fear and the and the feeling of unpredictability in the world, and and in some families that that idea is really kind of intolerable. And there's a real discomfort with expressing a lot of stories around around that because the feelings kind of raise too much, and just kind of create too much distress. Uh, you know, that's that kind of tolerance for, for affect, for emotion, expressing emotions versus kind of a constriction and a, a fear of expressing those feelings. That dictates a lot about kind of how much stories can be, you know, difficult stories can be shared. And I guess the original source of the story is the person that sets the tone for what is comfortable and what is not comfortable. Yeah, for sure. You can't and you don't want to sort of force people or bombard people with this idea that you have to talk about your traumatic experiences. Um, but when people are in a trusting relationship, such as in therapy, or if, or if it's with a partner, you know, like a, a, a husband, wife, a, a, a 
boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, whatever, um, that they trust, that they feel close to, that they can open up with. Um, it is helpful for people to open up, you know, and and kind of keeping keeping it inside does, you know, is associated with all kinds of mental health difficulties. And so it is important for people at some point, again, you, people don't want to, it's, not, it's important for people not to feel forced to talk about anything. But if it's in a context where they feel safe, then, yeah, opening up is really helpful for people. Can you give me an example of what is the damage that happens to a person who's had to keep secrets? Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's kind of a, an impoverishment of relationships. I mean, there's this kind of a, 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 a sense that, that honesty is dangerous, that, that uh, being myself, if, if people know, actually know the terribleness of who I am, then they'll, then they'll reject me. I mean, it's really, it's, it's a damage to the sense of self. It's a damage to, to, to how they engage uh, their relationship world. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it, it can be really problematic for people. It sounds to me, in many ways, it's a bit of a minefield. And I know for, as parents, we feel this anyway, or maybe I do. That, you know, you make mistakes because maybe you shouldn't share this, maybe you should share this, maybe you should be vulnerable, maybe you shouldn't let them see that you're vulnerable, maybe you should protect them. Like, there's all these questions, I think, for many parents all the time, unless I'm generalizing my own experience, but I think it must be difficult for most parents to know, how do you know when it's okay, when your kids can handle it, and when they can't? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I agree with you. It's... Um, uh, very much dependent on context and so so i think the thing to check in with is um the way your kids are feeling in in engaging in the discussion i wonder that in families too you know there's often a dynamic of withholding information if you know that somebody wants it (laughs) and i wonder if that's what you learned as a child how do you avoid that becoming your pattern your paradigm for your life no, it's 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 very hard for parents who have been through through trauma, and and very often they they cut off aspects of themselves in order to manage the task of raising kids. And one of the things that very often people who have who are uh, survivors of trauma um, have trouble with is accessing their own anger. Accessing, and y- you have to have a certain amount of anger to, to get through life. I mean, just, you know, you, you think about it, just to have chutzpah, to have, to have a certain amount of assertiveness, to, to have the ability to, to, to stand up for yourself. Um, you have to harness um, a, a voice, a healthy voice of anger, at, you know, and, and, and use it constructively in life. And that's hard for people who have suffered because of, you know, very aggressive kind of behavior they very often want to sort of eschew all anger. They just want to like like make it all go away. And that's tough when you're raising little kids. And again, I'm not saying you want to be angry at your kids, but you do sometimes need to stand up and tell your kids what's what's wrong and not okay and not let them walk all over you and, you know, set limits. And that, that sort of thing can be difficult if you're really uncomfortable with assertiveness and uncomfortable with, with having that, finding that voice of assertiveness in you. Um, so, so yeah, it can, it can be, it can be hard. And there are other, other difficulties as well in parenting. Um, and, but, but when you're working with, uh, parents who have trauma histories around parenting, sometimes actually helping them open up in a way that they can tolerate and that their child can tolerate Mm -hmm. so that the parent can say, you know, I've, I've been through some tough things too. And without going into the gory details, because I think you don't want to, you don't need to to upset little kids with the gory details, but to say, you know, there was a time when I was very afraid, and and uh, it was with someone who was very close to me, and 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 this is what happened, and it was very difficult, and I get scared too, and or or I sometimes and I sometimes really have trouble believing people. I think some people are lying to me sometimes because I I because I've had that happen. And, people said to me something that was very, and it was a very yucky thing. It was a very upsetting thing. So you can have a developmentally appropriate conversation, even with a young child, um, if you've had a trauma history, and share aspects of yourself where the child, oh, you know, gets to know something about their parents. And it actually brings parent and child together. It can actually be quite helpful. I mean, absolutely, there are people who are very uncomfortable with, with facing the horrors of their own past and and you know 
if among people who do have the more avoidant pattern, it, it's, th- there's often a real brittleness. There's often a, such a discomfort with emotional vulnerability, with, with feeling like, uh, you know, being able to open up is very difficult. Um, and, and, and there's this feeling of fear, this feeling of, uh, you know, if, if I, if I open this up, I will, you know, so much negative feeling will come out of me. It'll destroy everybody around me. It'll destroy myself. And, and this is not consciously thought out. This is all re- fairly unconscious. But, but um, there, is, there is this terrible fear. Thank you so much, Rob. This has been fantastic to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks. That was clinical psychologist Robert Mueller. His latest book is Trauma and the Struggle to Open Up, From Avoidance to Recovery and Growth.